name is Sherry Belknap. I am here to introduce our speaker to you tonight. But before we do that, I have to announce that the Flint Public Library is recording um, this, pr this presentation. And um, we want to make sure that you guys know you won't appear on the tape, just Mr. Shumovitz will appear on the tape. And if there's any questions that you feel uncomfortable with asking, Please wait till the end of the proceeding and you can ask them afterwards. That way it's not on the tape. So welcome to our seventh in a series of eight community seminars. It's presented by the Genesee County Bar Association. We'd like to thank the Flint Public Library for welcoming us to their facility and the Genesee County Bar Foundation for underwriting the cost of the seminar and the Legal Services of Eastern Michigan for partnering with the Genesee County Bar Association. Afterwards, there will be surveys in your packets. Please fill them out. It gives us valuable information as to what we can help with in other topics, as well as how you view this topic. Now I'm going to introduce our speaker for tonight. When I was charged with finding a presenter for tonight's topic, I had one person in mind, and that's Robert Shimovitz. He's been an attorney for 39 years. He is a graduate of Olivet College with a bachelor's degree. He went to Western Mich Michigan University to obtain his master's, and he went to Wayne State University to obtain his law degree. He's been a mediator since November 2005. He's admitted in the state of Michigan and licensed for the Supreme Court in the United States. One of the great things about Mr. Shinovitz is I've been his opponent, I've been before him as a well, with him as a mediator, and he is very knowledgeable in this field. He is one of the best real estate attorneys in Genesee County. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Shumovitz. One of the best. One of the best. Well, I heard that. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bob Shumovitz, and, and contrary to what you were told, that's what most people call me. And if you would like to address me, use Bob if you would, because I, I respond to that. Um, as Sherry said, I've been practicing law for quite a long time. And I've been doing real estate law. In fact, it turned out that I was looking at an old resume. I actually intended to do real estate law uh, as I was graduating uh, from law school. Over the years, I have found myself explaining a number of things uh, to clients. Um, and I'm going to just go through some notes that I made and, and kind of talk about some general things. Uh, if you have some questions that apply to what I'm talking about, hey, raise your hand. That that helps me out uh, also. Uh, if you would, if, if you would just look down here on the floor, I'm going to put a file folder down there. Uh, the space that that file folder is covering is unique. There is no place else in the entire world, in fact, if you want to go so far as to go this, talk about it, no place else in the universe that is the same as that space. And you can run that space all the way down to the, uh, uh, down to the ground and, and down to the center of the earth and then out, I guess, the other side. Uh, and you will never find anything that is as unique is that space. It can't be duplicated. The four points on this rectangular kind of uh, thing there, you will never find anywhere else in the world. So what we deal with in, in real estate is this uniqueness. And it, and it has some, you know, some attributes uh, over and above. Uh, you can't uh, duplicate it. Uh, there's, I'm going to talk about types of ownership. We have uh, a few people here. All of you probably have some interest in real estate of some sort. Whether it's you own the real estate, you own it to somebody else, you uh, uh, you are renting the, the real estate, you have a right to the real estate, and something like that. As to far as types of real estate, you can own it as an individual, and what happens when you die it goes to whomever it is that you direct by your estate plan, you know, your will and trust or, or whatever it is. Um, and uh, um, it probably will have to go through probate, especially if it's through uh, through your will. 
and the probate court simply directs where the ownership of the property goes. Just for your information, if you have a will, you can determine who gets it, and if you don't have a will, the law says who's supposed to get it. You can own property in the form of a corporation or through a corporation. You own the stock in the company. The company owns that little piece of property down there, and if you happen to pass away, your ownership in the stock of that corporation will move to whoever it is that it's supposed to go to. But you won't have to probate or have this little piece of property go through probate because it's owned by something that's not going to die. We know that the taxes are certain. I think Mark Twain was the one who came up with this one, or Will Rogers or something like that, and we know that we are going to die, those two things. But a corporation, if you don't want the ownership of a piece of property to change upon somebody's death, you'll put it into a company, an entity like a corporation, and so the stock of the corporation gets passed on. But the ownership doesn't change. It's going to just stay in the corporation. The same with a partnership. Let's take the two of you, and let's assume you're not husband and wife. You're just individuals, and you both own this piece of property. It's just that. You just own it. You're called tenants in common. If one of you passes away, your interest will pass to whoever it is that gets it coming out of probate or something like that. However, if you own it as a partnership, you own an interest in the partnership, the partnership owns the property, the interest in the partnership will change, but the ownership of that piece of property will not change. It stays in the partnership. Another way that you can own property that's not going to die, or have to pass to somebody else, is if you own it in a trust. Let's say you establish a trust as part of an estate plan, and you want the property to go to somebody else, go somewhere else, go to your church if you'd like, and you want to avoid probate. Not that probate is so bad. We lawyers make a few dollars putting property through probate, which is, to some of us, a good thing. And so what you'll do is you'll say, hey, I'm going to put it in the trust, and I'm going to give the trust some instructions on what happens when I pass away. Well, the trust is going to continue owning that property. Of course, you may say to your successor trustee, you know, the person that takes over after you, I want you to give it to Ms. Belknap back there after I pass away, and Sherry will have a big smile on her face and be very thankful. If you want to talk about, rather than sole ownership, tenants in common, I mentioned it just a minute ago. If you have people owning property as tenants in common, it's like this. It's the two of them. Or it can be 12, it can be 15. You know, it really gets a little out of sorts that way and difficult to deal with. But as each one passes away, their interest goes to someone else, possibly the probate or something else. And I'm going to come back to the idea of two or more people owning property as tenants in common. I'm going to move over here so that you can see me, ma'am. That's what you're leaning over. If you have a couple of people who own, let's say, agrarian land, a farm, and they decide as tenants in common, they don't want to get along anymore, which happens sometimes. And they can't decide what to do with the farm. They can't decide how to split it up. And the courts have something that they call partition. And in a partition action, you go to the court and you say, hey, we can't decide. So the court says, okay, tell you what we'll do. We'll appoint somebody who will come back and recommend to us, A, can the property be split? And then B, do you recommend somehow some way that this property can be split? It's called partition. And when I get into joint tenants in just a minute, I'm going to explain how this might be affected by a joint tenancy also. 
I think I'm going to add some things that could surprise you. If, on the other hand, you have a joint tenancy, let me pick on the two of you again. Let's say that, that you have a joint tenancy, and the two of you own a piece of property, and it says after, after your names, you know, A and B, as joint tenants. If one of you passes away, the law says the other joint tenant gets it. Cool. You don't even, you don't have to uh, do anything with a will. You know, so the Sherry back there, Sherry Cockman back there gets the property. If you decide that you don't want to be joint tenants anymore, then one of you can say, I don't want to be a joint tenant anymore. And you can do it through a quick claim deed or something like that. You can change the ownership of the property from that joint tenancy over to a tenancy in common, which I had explained just a couple of minutes ago. And then, if you can't decide how to split up the property, you can hire one of his lawyers, we can go to court for you, and we can have the judge decide how it, uh, how it should be split up through that partition action. One of the benefits, and by the way, Doc Knapp is an expert in this area, I'm not. Uh, one of the benefits of, of a joint tenancy today, the case just came down a few weeks ago, is that uh, if you have a transfer, if, if, if one of the joint tenants uh, passes away, that is not considered a transfer that will uncap your tax benefit of, of um, uh, you know, you're going to remember the old Proposition A that said uh, that the uh, taxing authority cannot raise your taxes more than. 5% or inflation, whichever is more or less, I, I, I can't recall which way it goes. Uh, there is a cap on what the local assessor can do. Now, if one of the joint tenants owning the property passes away, uh, that does not uncap that limit. Uh, here in, the, in this area uh, of the state, I think, or maybe the entire state, that uh, Proposition A benefit homestead exemption is worth about a third of your tax bill, or thereabouts. And so it's kind of a, an important thing to uh, remember. So in other words, you may want to pass, it, pass your, your land uh, through successions of, of joint tenancy. Sherry, if I'm wrong on what I just said, would you correct me? It's the lesser of 5% or the rate of the No, 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 I mean passing upon death of a, of a joint tenant. Yeah, the case was Pooster. It was where the parent put a child on the deed, and then a short time later, the parent passed away. The assessor was trying to argue that that was an uncapping of the property tax. And what the Court of Appeals, I think it was the Court of Appeals, no, Supreme Court, stated that the death of the parent was not an uncapping, but if the child goes to transfer it again, to the joint tenancy, it that is, is that uncapping. is uncapping. Okay, I was I was wrong. a little bit of what I just said was wrong, so you can't keep it uncapped by passing on the joint tenancy. By the way, one of the one of the benefits if, if you're older like me uh, and you own a piece of property and you have children, one of the benefits of uh, adding your children to your your ownership of property, making them a joint tenant. Uh, or a joint tenant with full rights of survivorship, is that if you decide you you want to make a change, that you want to sell the house, so to speak, you have to ask that child's permission. And uh, I think everybody here is old enough to have kids, and so you understand what it would be like for you, as much as you love that child, as much as that child loves you, what kind of a problem you can have if you have to go to your job and ask permission to sell a house. Ma'am? Oh, um, I've been a tenant renting an apartment in a high rise for quite a while, and I didn't say or do anything to deserve it, but can a lawyer like stop and possibly even compensate me for like, 
I've had like a lot of emotional duress and stress by a lot of the people that work where I live at and, and tenants like me where I live at, just a lot of people there kind of like the whole time I've been living there, like they all kind of like, like gang up on me and disrespect me and, and, and say and do whatever they want to me. And it's kind of like gotten out of hand and, and it's to the point where I figure, well, if I need a lawyer, I might ask him that question and can a lawyer do anything about that when I know that I don't really deserve to be under that kind of stress? Why don't you uh, give me a couple of minutes to think about it while I'm talking also? Oh, all right, all right, all right. Um, keeping in mind, what I'm keeping in mind, there's an awful lot of empty space around this town right now, not necessarily in high rises. Sir? Uh, my question is to your point about uh, passing your real estate down to your heirs. Um, what happens in, in a situation when you have a well, you have children, you have a home, but the home, as of right now, is worth much less than what the mortgage is? So, for instance, if I died today, they wouldn't want it. No one would want it. So. What's the process legally that the mortgage company can go to go through to would they go, take it to court and say they want to uh, go uh, you know against my estate if I die? How does that work? I just make it for myself. Um, let me go through joint tenants with full rights of survivorship. Sure. Let me go through tenants by the entireties, and then I'm going to come back to both of your, your questions. Okay? Thank you. If you have joint tenants with full rights of survivorship, one of the joint tenants passes away, it automatically goes to the other. If you have a half a dozen joint tenants with, you know, mom says, hey, I got six kids, I want to avoid probate, I'm going to put all six onto the, uh, onto the deed, so to speak. One of the kids passes away, goes to everybody else. Mom passes away, it goes to everybody else. If there is that right of survivorship tagged onto it, remember I talked about partition and going to court. Nobody, if you are one of those people who has a right of survivorship, nobody, including the courts, can take away your right of survivorship. You remember I said you can convert a joint tenancy into a tenancy in common? You can still do it, but you cannot take away from somebody, like any of you, that right of survivorship. So that if mom puts all the kids on the house, or mom puts all the kids on the farm, and they decided to uh, uh, change the, 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 the right of, of survivor, excuse me, they, they change the joint tenancy. They make it into tenants in common. And they then go to court and they say, okay, we've got this, this 500 acres and we have five of us. We're gonna have a new farm, a bunch of new farms, five farms, each with 100 acres. Cool, everybody gets their own farm. But when mom, excuse me, when, when, when any of them pass away, that 100 acre site, piece of land, goes to everybody else. And that's what you can't take away. It's just, it's a little, little, little bit of quirk in there. And, and what I've been trying to show you is there's a couple of problems involved with um, a joint tenancy with, with uh, full rights of survivorship. It's the survivorship that causes uh, the problem. And something, if you're, if you're old like me, and you decide you want to avoid probate, you don't want to go through the expense of doing a trust, you want to just set up everything with your kids or whatever, you know, as, as a joint tennis. That's something that you have to consider not doing. One, it takes away control. And two, you may not be able to, to change the situation around. Um, okay, let's talk about tenants by the entirety. This is a very, very special thing in the law. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold up my hand like this. You have a husband, and some of you are probably husbands. You have a wife, 
and some of you are probably wives, wives, and you have the husband and wife together. The law treats the husband and wife together as a separate entity. It's a separate person. It's a real person, but together. So if you get married, yeah, that's one of the benefits of being married. Neither the husband's creditors nor the wife's creditors can reach property owned as tenants by the entirety. So, if the husband has a financial problem and the wife doesn't, if they own their property as tenants by the entirety, what they're going to do then is insulate themselves, insulate the property owned as tenants by the entireties from the husband's creditors. I'm picking on guys like tonight. You know, I, I could go the other way and pick on, on women, but Doug Man would just just say something to me later on, and, and I just have to put up put up with that. Um, let's talk about your neighbors. I I really don't know of a cause of action. A cause of action is a lawsuit. There's a right to a lawsuit that would fit into your situation, man. I really don't. I've never seen it. 39 years of practicing law, three years of, of law school before that. Now, even when I was working on the MBA, I even had some law classes back then. I, I really don't. Um, probably uh, other people that I, I've known who had neighbor problems, they found another place to live. But right now, I don't have enough money to pay the mover and get another place and all, all that you got to do to move. I, right now, I don't have the money to... Eventually, you will. Well, I hope so. I, hope I can tell you that, that I just moved my office from one place in, in the building that I'm in to another, and I don't want to have to go through that expense for a long, long time. It's not easy, and it's not cheap to move. Um, as far as foreclosure is concerned, let me go through the process. You want to buy a piece of property, but you don't have enough money to just write a check. And so what you're going to do is you're going to go to somebody or something with the money. And you're going to say to your seller, hey, if I can get the money, I'll buy you a piece of property. To which the seller says, hey, that's great with me. Can you do it within a certain period of time? You say, yeah, I can do it. I can. And, and, and then you go to do a closing, a lawyer's office, a title company, you know, something like that. And you sit down and what you do is you say to whoever's lending the money to you, I'll give you an interest. We'll call it an encumbrance. I'll give you an interest, a mortgage, a, 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 a lien against the property that I'm owing, that, that I'm going to own. And so they said, fine, we're going to write you a check. Or we're going to write the title company or somebody a check. And then you're sitting down at the table and you hand over this check or somebody hands over the check. And in exchange for the money, they give you a deed. And then you turn around since you're now the owner. And by the way, that's how you transfer ownership is you, is you just hand the deed over. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, uh, so you now have a deed in your name. They have the money, and at the same time, instantaneously almost, you're going to sign a lien against what it is that, that you bought. Everything's great. You move in, you spend a lot of money moving, and, and uh, everything's fine. And then you lose your job, or you have a medical emergency, or you have a medical expense. And, and these are the things that cause people to not pay. Sherry, do you do, you do bankruptcy, don't you? Yes. Yeah, and it, it's probably the two things, losing jobs and, and, and medical expenses that forces people into, into bankruptcy. But, and the, and, the, and the mortgage company says, hey, you know, we, uh, we'd like to work out something with you. And that we'd like to give you about 90 days to do that. And they send you a notice. The notice says, hey, you got two weeks, let us know or have somebody else let us know that you want to work something out and you can't work something out. 
Let's assume you can't do it. Mortgage company says, we are exasperated. We don't want to take your house from you, but we're going to have to do something. And so what they do is they do, they prepare a, uh, a notice. And they send a notice to a local newspaper. By the way, uh, I live in the southern end of the county, and we have a, a newspaper down there that comes out once every uh, couple, a couple of times a week. And they publish these notices. And it's the smallest type you can possibly imagine, but it gets published. Uh, and, and, and after they published it at least once, they think they have to do it five, four or five times, uh, four or five weeks in a row. Um, after the first time, the deputy sheriff has to come out to the house or wherever you are and tack or otherwise affix a copy of that notice on your um, on your door or someplace that, that's pretty evident uh, where you can see in, in this house. And what the notice says is, you're in default, this is how much you owe, this is who you are, this is all who we are, and we're going to have a sale of your property. And what they do is, is they have the sheriff auction off your property. And they're going to bid in probably, so I'm going to repeat that word, probably, the amount of money that you owe in the mortgage. And if there are no other bidders, or that's the highest bid, something like that, then the sheriff is going to sign a deed of the ownership of the house over to the bank, or whatever the financial institution is, or grandfather, or whoever put it the money. They're going to record that deed within 20 days at the Register of Deeds office, and then you're going to have, probably, six months to come up with somebody to buy that that property from you so you can pay out the mortgage. Or you're going to have to come up with the money from somebody. You may be able to find another lender. If you don't come up with the money within that period of time, then their title, the word is ripens, and they become, at that point in time, the owner of the property. You are now, technically speaking, a trespasser in what you thought was your own home. In fact, it used to be your own home. But the law considers you a trespasser, and then they have to get you out of the house. That's the process, folks. There's a, there's a, a landlord-tenant action for this sort of thing, uh, and, and you go before the judge, and the judge and you say to the judge, hey, judge, uh, these folks, I do a little a few of these, these folks uh, were in the house, or on the, are in the house, and there was this foreclosure, and they're not the owners anymore, and, and we'd like the possession of the house, and the judge will almost always uh, say yes. Sherry came up with a, a, a thing not too long ago where she was able to beat it, but only because something very unique uh, took place, and, and her argument in that case, she was telling me about it before we started here today, uh, was adopted as the gospel by our uh, Michigan Supreme Court. Has to do with the uh, ownership of the land, ownership of the mortgage, uh, I'm sorry, ownership of the mortgage and, and, and the rest of, of those things. That's the process. To your particular situation, if, let's assume there are no other assets, no other things of value that are in the probate estate, The title company, I'm sorry, the, the mortgage company is going to find itself with the property back. The kids, so to speak, will not have any liability because they never agreed to be liable for that debt. And, and, and if you're going to be liable for somebody else's debt, you pretty much have always have to have that in writing and signed by the party uh, who, who you want to have liable. So in all probability, uh, the kids will have nice memories of grandma's house or mom's house or whatever it is, and that's going to be about it, and it's going to go for a very low price to somebody else. But if there are assets, then... Okay, now, if the mortgage company bids in 
what is owed on the mortgage, then the debt is extinguished. Goes away. It's paid off. Because the mortgage company gets something of value equal to the debt. So there's no more debt. It was paid. It was paid in the form of ownership of this property. You raised your, your eyebrows when I said that. Yes, sir. Did I, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, if that's the case, then it doesn't matter what's in the estate. But if there's a discrepancy on the mortgage between the value and the, the mortgage is greater than the value of the home. That's what I'm talking about. Then the mortgage company would go after the asset. Ah, now, let's, do, let's deal with that. Let's assume that the mortgage company looks at the situation and says, hey, we have a house that's worth $80,000. We have a mortgage that's, that is, is where the note is, is at least $100,000. You got a $20,000 discrepancy in there. And, and by the way, we are seeing a lot of this uh, uh, today. There's a discrepancy in there. It's, it, there's, a, there's a shortage in there. The mortgage company can bid in. It is allowed to bid in the distressed sale value of the property. In other words, um, there's an auction. The auction's for one hour. Who's going to come in and bid on the house? The mortgage company and somebody else. And, and the, the, the law says um, that where you have a distressed sale, you're not going to get as much money as when you have time to uh, peddle the real estate, so to speak. And the law recognizes this, this idea, and allows um, a mortgage company to bid in less than what you would otherwise think that the house is worth. It even lowers it there more. Now, the mortgage company then has to go in, we're doing it by advertisement, the mortgage company goes into court after that and sues for the difference. In your particular situation, because you're in probate court, and probate court has the same jurisdiction, let's say, of, of, as the circuit court, the mortgage company can then come into the probate court, one, make a claim against those other assets for the $20,000 or whatever it is, um, and if somebody puts up a fight, uh, they can cause a lawsuit to be filed, and you can try the case, which means that the, the the estate in the situation will bring it to in its appraiser, and the appraiser will say, "This property is really was really worth on a distressed sale basis ninety thousand dollars." I'm sorry, I, I've got my party wrong. I was looking at something over here. The mortgage company will, will come in and say, "This con this house on a on a distressed sale basis was worth eighty thousand dollars." The estate will come back and say, no, no, no. This house on a distressed sale basis is really worth $9,000. So you have a $10,000 controversy between the two of them. And you let somebody in the middle decide. That's why we hire independent judges. Did I answer your question? Yes. Oh, took a little while. Um, Let's talk about uh, adverse possession, acquiescence, uh, boundary disputes. Everybody in this room has heard something about adverse possession. Maybe not those two words. Where someone else occupies a piece of property. Yeah, it's not really just mowing the lawn, but if somebody else occupies a piece of property for a minimum of 15 years, and it's not their property. It's the neighbor's property. Um, they are entitled, the person doing the occupying, to go to court and have the court decide that they are, in fact, the owners of the property. Um, I'm not on my first wife, but anyway, when I'm stating my, my, my present wife, I was handling one of these cases. And her father had, somebody had tried to make her father the victim of one of these things uh, and, and lost. 
my late brother-in-law was a pretty good lawyer, so you know, I took care of that. Uh, but she just couldn't understand how I could represent somebody uh, who was trying to do this or get involved in, in, in this sort of thing. That was a long, I had to try that, that case. I think we tried it before Judge Borgo, who was before your time, Chair. Uh, that's some fun. Anyway, you have to show if you're going to try to grab somebody else's property under these circumstances, and you have to show each and every one of these elements that I'm going to go through. You have to have possession that is actual. You really have to occupy the property in one form or another. It has to be visible. Nothing, nothing invisible here. It really has to be out there in the open, invisible. Uh, as I just said, it has to be out there in the open. It has to be notorious. Somebody's got to know that you're there and, and you're not the owner of the property. I made the list of the rest of them. Uh, it has to be exclusive. You can't share this piece of property with the, with the real owner. You have to have it all, all to yourself. It has to be hostile. It has to be uh, against their interest. It has to be under a claim of right. Say, you, know, you tell people, you know, this is mine, that sort of thing. And it has to be continuous and uninterrupted for 15 years. If you can hit all of those elements, whatever that number is, then you are entitled to go to court and have a judge declare that you own that property. It doesn't happen very often, folks. It really doesn't. Aha, a victim. Or somebody who's on the other side to sue. Uh, let's, let's do this. I don't have a, this is the only thing I was going to need a chalkboard or anything else for. And so, when uh, uh, when Eileen back there said, I think it's by the way from the, from the Bar Association, uh, said, you know, do you need anything like this? I said, nah, I don't need anything like this. Uh, here's two pieces of property here and here. Here's the boundary line right in between the two of them. Here is a fence that comes down like this and cuts over. And the fence has been there, let's say, for 15 years. Let's call it 16 years. And, the, and it's gone through a couple of different, this property's gone through a couple of different owners. And each time the ownership changed, the prior owner of this property said to the buyer, hey, I own that piece of property on your side of the fence. And even the real estate company says, you, you own the fence. In this situation, the court will say that this owner owns to this side of the fence, this side of the fence, and that this owner no longer owns to that line that used to be the boundary between the properties. The fence now becomes the boundary between the properties. Uh, finished one of these about a year ago up near Montrose, did one like this in Burton. Um, let me think. I've had, I don't know, a few of them over the years, maybe a half a dozen where it really got serious. Um, and they get interesting. People get really upset about these things. Yes, ma'am? When that happens, as soon as the fence is put in, Shouldn't the owner that's being abused then go immediately somewhere and get some kind of resolution to it then? Because when you wait, that's the problem is waiting. Is what I recommend, what I recommend, and I've done this a number of times, is that there is a letter that is written from this owner to this owner that says, I give you permission to maintain your fence on my property. Or I give you a license to maintain your fence on my property. And what that letter does is it takes out the element of under a claim of right. It takes out the element of hostile. It takes out the element of notorious. And without one of these elements in this whole thing, you cannot have a judgment that grants this property fenced in 
to the other neighbors. Seems like the simplest thing to do is when you put a fence up and someone's done, say, take your fence down. Yes, ma'am. Hospital or whatever, that's what I do. The that's 15 year period. Yeah. Anytime a the 15 year period. Anytime in the 15 year period, you have a right to go to court and sue to have that fence removed. Now, there's a judge down in, in, uh, down in Fenton, Mark McCabe, very, very smart man. I've known him as long, I think I've practiced a few years longer than he's been a lawyer too. But I've known him for a very, very long time. I have a lot of respect for him. I even respected him before he was a judge. And Judge McCabe and I differ on what to do, how to get rid of that fence. I say you can do it in landlord-tenant court as a trespass. He says, no, you have to go to circuit court on an ejectment action. Uh, it's a lot cheaper to do it in landlord-tenant court, and he's a landlord-tenant judge, by the way, than it is to go to circuit court. But anyway, it's a little, he and I have a little difference of opinion. But you can't take the fence down yourself. I have recommended to a number of people that they could. I mean, sure. I wonder while they're sleeping and then the fence is just... That's a good time to do it. You know, it's a very good time to do it. No, because it's sure. on your property. It, yeah, it's on your property. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it may be their fence, but they still put it on your property. Right. Pull it up and move it. So anything they put on your property becomes your property? Not necessarily. Oh. Uh. Uh. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I said pick it up and move it. Okay. They say take it. Pick it up and move it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. What if the what if the city owned the property? And say it again, please. What if the city owned the property? Say that you have Okay, okay. You have there's a statute. Mm -hmm. property. There is a statute in the state of Michigan that says if you are occupying a governmentally owned property, you cannot uh, you cannot adversely possess and ultimately own that property. The statute went into effect in 1988, 78. I can't remember. I think it may have been 1988. I think it would be possible, I, I don't know really what the law is, just logic, that if the government occupied your property and fit all of these elements, that it could go to court and have your property declared its land. So you, you, they, you can't do it against them, but very possibly they can do it against you. It just off the top of my head, I'm just logically thinking how I know how the things come together. My thought was if, if you own a piece of property with your house on it and there's a piece of property right next to yours that had a house on it and say it caught fire and burned down, and the people that own the property, they just they just vacate it. Then, no. then the city would would take over the property, right? Mm, say no. they say they filled no. in the basement and just no. made it an open no. land. No. It and and I see people do this from time to time. They just like make a little garden next door or something, you know? Couldn't. Okay. Let's think in terms of somebody, someone. Some people, some think, own the property. Unless they have done something that would deprive them of their ownership of that property, it's going to continue to be theirs. So unless you give somebody a deed, unless you fail to pay your taxes. That, that's what I was thinking. Okay, that's something, something, something entirely different. That's something entirely different. Fail to pay your taxes or something like that. That's going to stay in your name. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we have a statute in the state of Michigan that says if you fail to pay your taxes on a piece of property, that the government has the right to take that piece of property, foreclose, so to speak, on that piece of property. Keep in mind, I'm using the foreclosure in two different ways. One, where there's an instrument granting the right to foreclose, and the other where there's a statute granting the right to foreclose. Uh, they end up with it. The government will end up with it in satisfaction of the debt that you owe for taxes. And then they can turn around and sell it to somebody else. I have only known of one instance, my personal knowledge, where the government sued for the taxes that were owed rather than foreclosed. That was auto work. 
That was a lot of money. But that was all the world. And, and I just, I heard it one day, I was at City Hall and I heard, had been talking about it. I got a little bit of an education. Did he get up? Pardon? Did he get up? When they Did they get the collect the money? Yeah, they, probably the company went broke or didn't have any assets or, or, or something. They may have. The city ended up with it or the county or the, the state ended up with it. You know, they knocked down the building and they're using it for uh, U of M now. Um, let's talk about acquiescence. For those of you who are interested, because I can never remember how to spell it, it's A C Q U I E S C E N C E, which is two people, two property owners, tacitly agreeing that a line is their boundary line. So, in other words, if our owner here and our owner over here agree that this fence line is the boundary line for the property. I think it's a term of about the same, the same 15 years. This fellow over here on this side of the fence can go to court and say, Judge, we really agree on this uh, uh, fence line being our, uh, uh, our boundary line. We're the same 15 years. We'd like to have you put it in our name. And the judges say, well, all other things being equal, hey, this is what I find. A judgment will be entered declaring the property to be owned by this party. Not this one, but this party. Please note that what is common here between acquiescence and adverse possession is that you need a judgment. You need a court of law, or court of equity, actually, a court to say who owns the property. And the law recognizes that judgment as determining who owns the property. Does it have to be surveyed? <clears throat> no, but it's an awful good idea. I don't think I've ever I, I don't think I've ever been involved with, with, with one of these things when it wasn't surveyed. Yes, ma'am. What if um okay who owns the actual line then that the fence is on? Like say your neighbor says, okay, this is my side, and you say this is my side, and neighbor puts up an ugly old fence, and then you say, I don't want that ugly old fence. Who owns the actual property line that that fence is on? You own to that line. It's oh, an okay. infinitely small line. So he can put up Think of it, think of it as, as you've been sharpening this pencil all day long, it is really sharp, and you draw a line on a piece of paper, okay? They own to either side of that line. Think of how, how narrow that line could be, and, and that's what you own to. They butt up against each other. Okay. And you're talking about contiguous pieces of property. So, um, you have to go to the local uh, authority, the, the, the township, the city, or whatever, and look at their ordinances to determine what the requirements are for a fence. And uh, I have said to somebody, I have said to people, if you do this, we will put up the ugliest fence you will have ever seen. Okay. Um, we have a case that's in the Court of Appeals right now. I think it's the third time up there. I'm sorry, it's on its way to the Supreme Court. Where a fella, oh, I should have mentioned that. There's, there's a lake property like this, uh, edge of a lake, and somebody owns all of the land underneath the lake, and they owe to this, own to this line right here. This is ground between the two. And the fella that owns all of this said, you either do what I want you to do, or I'm gonna put it up the ugliest fence you will have ever seen on this line. And he did it! Um, it's down in Grand Lake Township. I don't wanna tell you where. Well, what if you put like a tree then up to that ugly old fence, and then the branches and things go over on their side of the property? Can they come and pack off half of the sure. tree? Up to the line.
up to that line. So if you know if you're trying to cover up their fence, then they can say, oh, fine, I'll just chop off half the tree. Uh, there are some trees that you can buy that grow very, very fast. And, and their leaves and their branches are very, very narrow. You, you can get around that problem. So no. okay. yeah, plenty of bushes over there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we'll cover that. I have some notes on it. Before I get into mediation, does anybody else have any problems? Any, any questions here? Yes, sir. Okay. I had a situation. I, I came back from the Persian Gulf 20 years ago. When I got back, I was in the Marine Corps. I bought a mobile home. <laughs> okay. The next year, I was involuntarily discharged. I didn't know what I was going to do. I drank a little bit. I smoked some weed, and I, I don't even. I know disappeared. <laughs> and uh, just eight years ago, I was checking my credit report, and it says that I owed this. I owed six thousand dollars when I left for the mobile home. I got a credit company, a collection agency, that I've been paying for the past five years. And they're telling me I owe $13,000 and I can't pay it off because I'm just paying on the interest. You have a problem. I have a problem. What can I do about it? You ever work for John Motors? No, sir. Oh, geez. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I asked you that question is that uh, virtually all of the consumer law that's handled here in this county is handled by the UAW GM Legal Services Plan. And they have some folks that, that, that work, that's large, pretty much the largest law firm in the county, that, that specialize in doing that sort of thing. Um, I can tell you that the, the note is good until the last uh, uh, installment is due. So you may have had some kind of a rolling thing with what you owed on that, on that note. By the way, I uh, I also was in the in uh, the Marine Corps, and I, that's how I got to law school from the GI Bill. It's a great program. It really is. Got me in education, and uh, I paid for for uh, graduate school to get my MBA, working out of the VA plant, and I had two jobs that summer, working at the VA plant, all oh, from about. Four on to maybe five or two in the morning, and then I had another job that I worked on from about ten until until four when I went to work there. And, and for which I am thankful to uh, uh, John Motors and uh, and our federal government. The goal of mediation is to reach a compromise or settlement of. A I'm sorry. I have a tenant question. Uh, I live at Sylvester Manor downtown. I used there. to live there. I've lived there many okay. years. Okay. Happily. Okay. I was between wives when I was doing that. I'll get I'll get a smile out of my league every time I mention something like that. Go ahead, man. I'm sorry. And uh, I, I live I have a lovely apartment, wonderful mm -hmm. apartment, and I'm having problems with this other tenant who was there before I moved in. Some of the tenants have been there 17, 18 years, you know, and it's a place where you go and you stay. Um, and little things, he was harassing me over little things. I had no problem with anyone but him. But other people had problems with him besides myself. And then last summer, I put some stuff in the dumpster. Well, because of my physical strength, I left the lid up because when I came back to put more in, I didn't want to have to struggle to get the lid back mm -hmm. up. And he happened to be out there, and I didn't speak to him, didn't have anything to do with it. And uh, he said, screaming at me, he said, don't leave that lid up. And I said, I left it up because of the difficulty. And I was in my car. I had backed up and, and then he started screaming and yelling at me and started rushing toward my car, which was frightening. So I was pointed out to the driveway. No one else was back there but the two of us. Mm -hmm. And so I rolled up my window that was open and he walked around the front of the car to the side was still screaming while I was left. Well, as I got to the side of the building, he started screaming, call the police, call the police, she hit me with her car. Mm -hmm. And I turned around and came back in. And Did you try to hit him this time? <laughs> <laughs> I have my own idea, so yes. Okay. And so one of the tenants just heard the noise and called the police. Mm -hmm. So they sent an ambulance. He refused to go. He said, I'm all right. Um, and the police came. The police took me to jail and fingerprinted me and took my picture. Oh. 
when you said to me the other neighbors were having problems with this guy too, it made me think about this particular situation. So I, I'm not going to advise you, but I'm going to say what you might want to do is talk to your neighbors. Talk to the other people who are affected by this, this person. People want to get donor, get involved in things like well, that. Well, that's another problem. That's, that's a problem of proofs. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk, I'm talking tonight about um, concepts. Concepts and, and, and rules that, that we have to live by. Now we're talking about your power of persuasion and getting the other neighbors to go along and, and help you out. I didn't even ask them, I, you know, as my that's, that's, a, that's a detail. Right. And, and, and talk to the fellow you retain for the church. Well, I don't have or to actually go to him and see what he says, but yeah. I just put it off because I, I'm not informed. I don't know anything about things like this. Well, you do now. And, uh, well, so I talk to whoever I can talk to and read and things okay. to try and get some, know what questions you need to ask him. You know. So thank you. I appreciate your input. Um, let's talk about mediation. Uh, the idea of mediation is to reach a compromise or settlement of a, of a dispute. The process is a neutral person uh, that helps the parties talk about the problem and try to negotiate a resolution. I'm a part of the community resolution center, center <laughs> who, by the way, rents the second floor <laughs> of the bar association. Uh, they have a bad stairway into the lease. Yeah, I'm the one that did it. <laughs> and. Uh, the mediator becomes actively involved with the parties. The mediator doesn't need to be convinced of the correctness of uh, the party's position, uh, but the mediator is there to facilitate the communication of the parties to each other. The way I like to do it is I'll, I'll, I have a couple of rectangular tables. I'll sit at one table at the table, I'll put one party here, I'll put one party there, their attorneys or whatever behind them. Sherry's not through it. Um, and, and we just talk about the problem, try to come up with some kind of a solution. Uh, try to get them to talk to each other. Uh, the mediator's stance is not uh, prove your case to me. That's, you do that with an arbitration where somebody has the authority to make a decision. The, what the mediator does is try to get the folks to, to uh, come up with a solution themselves, and he kind of, or he or she kind of says, uh, let me help you help each other. Uh, like I said, don't expect, if, if you get involved in one of these things, that the mediator to decide the, the matter for you. The mediator doesn't have that authority. Um, he or she is going to listen to your position as well as your argument, as will the other side, either by the other side listening to you or to what the mediator uh, is conveying for you and, and with your position. By the way, when I do a mediation, uh, I have a, a rule that no party can interrupt the other. You and I were not in a mediation, and I, and I really did want to interrupt you at a certain point so that I could make a point. I know. Uh, and, and usually, uh, a lot of times, it, it takes people a while to, to get everything that they want to say out. It, just, it, it takes patience sometimes uh, to, to uh, uh, put up with that, even though uh, we, as somebody listening, wants to jump right in and, 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 and segregate what they're, what they're doing, and get the different ideas, and answer them as they, as they come, up, come along. Um, after the initial session, that's where you, you know, people are talking to each other, uh, Media will probably meet with one party privately in what we call a caucus. Uh, and I guess you could uh, uh, compare that to the caucus that you have at a political rally. Uh, caucuses are, are usually held in a smaller room, possibly the mediator's office. I now have uh, uh, two, two rooms in my office, a conference room. And uh, so I can do that there. I don't have to have anybody sitting in my office. Uh, the party not meeting with the mediator, uh, maybe left in the conference room where the joint session was held, you know, that's where everybody's together, uh, or may wait in another room. Um, during this, this caucus, when, when I sit down, or, or any of us mediators sit down with somebody, uh, we're going to go over their case. 
and, and we're going to go over um, uh, the high points, low points, yeah, stuff in the media, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, uh, in the middle. And what we're really doing is exploring strengths and weaknesses. Um, one thing that's really unique about, about a mediation is that whatever is said at the, at the mediation is absolutely confidential. We have a legal obligation to not say what goes on in a mediation. But a mediation is an attempt to settle, almost always, a lawsuit. And the law says that settlement negotiations in a lawsuit cannot be brought up in court. Now, there are a few judges that will listen to them, one in particular. And, and we'll, we'll give a lot of thought to it. I don't want to mention uh, that judge's name. On the other hand, if the parties authorize the mediator to say something, he can go public with it. But that doesn't happen very often. What I do when I sit down at the caucus, I will say, what are you going to authorize me to say to the other side? At the same time, what do you especially not want me to say to the other side? And usually pretty people have a pretty good idea of, of what that's all about. Um, the, the caucuses continue as the mediator moves back and forth between the parties. You guys remember when Kissinger, Kissinger was our Secretary of State? And he was going back and forth. Shuttle diplomacy is what he called it. That's the same thing. We do it. We, and and that's, uh, that's just a way to handle your, your business. Um, a lot of times, as a result of our asking questions, we, we, we will gather kind of a pretty good understanding of what a case is all about, what the areas of agreement are, what the areas of disagreement are. Um, and at some point in time, the, the parties are going to tell the mediator uh, really what, what where they want to go, which gives the mediator an idea of what kind of a compromise might be reached. Uh, and at this point, there's a change. It's kind of subtle, but it changes from an analysis of the dispute, trying to figure out what's going on, to uh, actual settlement discussions. For reasons that I don't know if I really understand, almost always, things are going to come down to money. <laughs> now, in your case, getting somebody to not do something is not a matter of money. In your case, getting somebody or some people to not do something is not a matter of money. Why not? Because you're talking about interpersonal relations that cannot be quantified with a dollar sign in front of it. That's just neighbors, problems between neighbors. And problems between neighbors have been going on for, for since the beginning of time. Whether it's it's two people that live next door to each other, two tribes that live next door to each other, two nations that are right next door to each other, especially when one wants to grab the land of another. But this has been going on since the beginning of time between neighbors of some sort or another. Um, I prefer the joint session method of, of handling these things. Give me a minute. Uh, some other mediators don't want the parties to meet at all. And I have attended mediations, as usually as an attorney, uh, representing a client, where that has, has uh, uh, taken place. I used to sit down with both parties, both sides, and it is a process. And uh, like I said before, have, have each side uh, explain his position. Among other things, it gives the people a chance to vent. What I have found, unless we're talking about a whole bunch of money and losses, is that what people want to do is have somebody else listen to them. They want the opportunity to say what's on their mind. And many times, that is really all they want. That satisfies them. 
the tax doesn't satisfy at all. But a lot of times, it, it, it really does. Um, I've had other situations where things were kind of unique. I had a mediation not too long ago that ended up in the newspaper. I, I'm reading this thing, I say, hey, this is the one I did. Oh, yeah, yeah, we did do this and we did do that. But in that one, the entire thrust of the mediation was the plaintiff's attorney fees. We were talking about $40,000. And he needed the money. He really did. And uh, case didn't settle, and it ended up getting um, thrown out of court. One of the things that I do have people do is take notes so they, they, they can remember. You know, it's like all the stuff that I have here. They can remember what they want to uh, talk about. Um, I, uh, along the line of the venting thing, I, I wrote down some stuff. I just want to read to you rather than try to paraphrase. It is my experience that telling that opening statement in a mediation provides a physical catharsis, visible catharsis. A lot of times I can see a kind of a burden coming off of a people's, uh, people's shoulders. And when they finish, they have finally told somebody other than their attorney what the problem is, what their side of the story is. Once they do that, they can then shift into a, a settlement mode. If you're going to get involved in the mediation process, please, for the benefit of everybody, have everybody who is necessary to make a decision present. So you don't have the situation where a husband has to call his wife. It, it has happened. I have never had this situation where a woman was there as, as, as a party, always with hus husbands who show up without their wives. Um, in one situation, the guy got on the phone with his wife and then disappeared. He left. I think she had a few words to say. Hmm. And then uh, another one I had, uh, I think at the bar, bar association office, and you guys saw it. Guy took 45 minutes talking to his wife. She, he finally talked her into it. We're, we're running a little short on time now.